Amen. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Good worship this morning. I was excited to be back in God's house today, personally. It's been two and a half months. The last time was when we had D now, was when we had worship service. And uh, so it's been a little while, but praise the Lord, uh, we're back in the house. Praise God for that. It's good to see you as well. Uh, I wanted to start off by uh, saying to uh, our graduates that we love you. In fact, uh, we love you so much. Um, I was hoping and praying that we would have this opportunity to honor you in some way, at least before the summer got started well and everybody goes in their different directions. And I am thankful to our God that he allowed this as soon as he did so we could do this before summer breaks. Um, normally we would have done that about two weeks ago, but uh, obviously reasons that uh, we couldn't. So we just want you to know we care about you, we love you. In fact, I want to say this, I've put it on social media before, I love you more than tacos. If you know me, that's a lot of love, okay? And so this is, this is a group here that we're already graduating two times over, some three times uh, since I've been here. So this is the group I had all sixth grade and up. Are you with me? And so it's been a privilege and honor to minister to you and that it is ongoing ministry in your lives that you will forever have a student pastor here in me and you will forever have pastors here who love you and want to serve you wherever God sends you. That is, that is, that is an anchor to your life. Just let that be known. Um, but I, I, I want to say this to you as we get started. According to God's Word, I believe, uh, and, and the news and the world matches God's Word that we are living in the last days. There's no doubt. Jesus is coming soon. I echo Revelation 22:20 20 enthusiastically when John says, Come, Lord Jesus. I can't help but say, Maranatha, in the name of Jesus Christ. Yes, I want more people to come to know Christ, but I'm telling you, I look forward and with anticipation when the Son of God splits the heavens and we go home. I can't help because as I'm, as I'm getting more deeper in my faith, the Lord just drives that home. As a follower of Jesus Christ, that should be your desire. Your desire is to be with Lord and see Him face to face. I, I want to start off by this, this, uh, this quote as we launch into the text. The, uh, the British preacher G. Campbell Morgan once said, It is a remarkable thing that the church of Christ persecuted has been the church of Christ pure. Persecution, not liking, never do we but it purifies the church. It uh, strengthens the church, really. We can see that in the book of Acts. We can see throughout uh, the life uh, of history and how the enemy meant for bad and God used it for good. He also continues to quote, on the other hand, the church of Christ patronized has been the church of Christ impure. And so that's a telling truth. The persecute. Persecution follow, followed our Lord. It will follow His church. It will follow us believers. And, but it will lead to purity. It will lead to us growing in the Lord if we take it the right way. And it will just drive us deeper in our faith with our God. But a church that's patronized, that's just uh, tickled by a little sprinkling of God's Word and more so about just whatever a preacher would want to preach, uh, it will not change this world. It will not change it. Uh, already this morning, Pastor Aaron has preached two sermons about love. This is a day you actually get a two-for-one sermons today, all right? So you go online and be sure to listen to his sermon uh, from this morning, as well as what you'll, you'll hear this morning about the graduates. I'm not here today to persecute you. Uh, no way. I'm here to encourage you. Uh, but I... I'm telling you because I'm so convinced these are the last days. I'm not here to patronize you either. I want to shoot straight with you, as you know I always have, about God's Word. Because if I was to say this is my last time to preach to you, if I may never see you again, these are the words I would say. And I say it uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. Come to encourage you, to exhort you, to lift you up, to follow Jesus, not just today, but all the days of your life. 
And so the subject I want to preach to you about is don't drift from Jesus. Look at the text. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4 and then verses 9 through 11. Look what the Bible says. Uh, We don't know the actual author of this. It doesn't state it. Some speculate Paul. Some say not. We don't know exactly, but we do know that this is a very strong book. A theological book, an encouraging book to the believers to, to go the distance in their faith. In fact, the first chapter is totally set up to let us know about, about how God spoke and speaking in the last days. Verses 1 through 4 talks about that. And it tells us how God is speaking through His Son. Uh, that He's at the right hand on, uh, of God and he's, He is preaching to us through His Word, through the prophets, through the preachers. And for some reason, there was some speculation as to how angels could be higher than God, than Christ. He sets us up in the first chapter about how that's not so. That angels have their place, but they are not Jesus. Are you with me? There's God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and there's angels that serve Him. In that order right now, it's God, angels, and then us as we speak. That is, us, as us here on earth. When we get to heaven, the order will shift. It will always be God, then us, then angels. That's the way the Bible says. Only because we don't live in the heavenlies. We still live in the earthly. We battle sin. Angels have never, ever uh, battled sin. And so, he sets us up. He goes through the whole text about really saying that Jesus Christ is the one who be worshipped above all. That it's his throne that will be given for that no one will will bow before anything else but Jesus. Reminds us that angels have them placed as they minister to us. Yes, praise the Lord. They are ministering spirits. But the Bible says that Jesus is always and will always supersede angelic beings. Don't get them out of order. Don't get them out of order. So this text he sets up just to let us know who is superior, and that's Jesus, his word. So I'm going to read the text, verses 1 through 4, and then I'm going to save 9 through 11 for the ending. Look what the Bible says, church. It says, therefore, we must pay closer attention. Listen to the word, highlight that. Pay closer attention to what we have heard, comma, lest we drift away from it. Verse 2 says, for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, And every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. Verse 3 says, How shall we escape if, if we neglect such a great salvation? What a question. Latter part of verse 3b says, It was declared at first by the Lord, the writer says, and was attested to us by those who heard. Verse 4 says, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to His will. Verse 9 and 11 says, as it talks about everything being put in subjection under His feet, His his feet meaning Jesus, verses 9, 10, 11 says, uh, now, in the latter part of verse 8, says, Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, that is, to Christ, but we see him, that is, Jesus, for whom for a little while was made lower than the angels. So it tells us for a little while. You say, what's that little while? When he came to earth. When he came uh, born of a virgin, Mary. When he came... To, to live this sinless life for us as our example and to, to go to the cross for our sins. That's the only time there was a, a was transition of, of uh, actual ranking. Now I say that loosely. Jesus was always number one. He was always in charge. But because he's here on earth in the flesh, it tells us that. It says, for a little while, namely Jesus, latter part of verse 9, crowned him with glory and honor because of the suffering of death So that by the grace of God, he, Jesus, might taste death for everyone. Tells us what he did for us on the cross. Verse 10 says, uh, and I'll stop at verse 10. I meant to say verse 10. For it was fitting that he, for whom, by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons and daughters, mind you, to glory, should make the founder 
of their salvation perfect through their suffering. He talks about the founder. He talks about being the pioneer, the one who has gone before us. And so I want to talk about what it is not to drift. Not to drift. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. He says, Therefore we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. Notice the phrase, pay attention. Uh, he, he tells us, therefore, by, by the point of application. He just preached about angels' roles. Yes, but Jesus is always superior. The scriptural uh, fact of Jesus' superiority over angels has life-changing application. So he says, therefore, here's the application. And what's the application is? Pay attention. Pay attention. In fact, it's the words I've echoed for you for seven years. Listen with intent. What? To obey. That's, that's echoed throughout the scriptures. That's not a John Freeman statement. I've derived that from the book. Listen with intent to obey. Verse 1 tells us, therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we've heard. This writer is saying, hey, I've been preaching to you. I've taught you the scriptures. Pay attention. Listen. Graduate swaps, we're saying one more time. And church as a whole, when the sermons are preached, when the word is taught, listen. When you read your Bibles, listen. Listen, that's what the Bible says. This is, it is, this is what we must do in light of Jesus' superiority over angels. When Jesus speaks, everybody should listen. We must give more earnest heeds to the words of Jesus. That, that gives the idea there. Pay closer attention. Earnestly listen. Listen with intent for your life to be changed by the word. That is, pay closer attention. Uh, it's also in doing what we hear. When we listen intently, you'll, pra you'll practice what you listen. That is, we pay closer attention to what we've heard. There's an urgency. There's a necessity in listening and doing. They go hand in hand. You cannot listen to a sermon well if you don't practice it. It's true for all of us, for any message that we're ever given. And he says, why is that? Latter part of verse 1b says, lest we drift away. That's a scary verse. Verse chapter 2, 1b is scary. The word deliver, that is the word preach, the word proclaim, the word taught, lest we drift away. The writer had the drifting of a boat in mind. Such drifting happens naturally without an anchor to it. I was shopping yesterday. We actually went to Hobby Lobby. And I've been promising my precious bride to get some pictures up on the wall of our house for two years that we've been in that house this past May. I'm a little, I know I'm a little procrastinator on some things. Interior decoration, I need to ask Kate Parton about that. Amen. And, and others. So we were able to get some pictures up, and I was looking for one bigger picture to go over the microwave that I just painted this wall. There was, some, there was some stuff from the previous owner, and so I just finished painting it this week. It's one of my honeydews, and so I went to look for some pictures. And uh, I didn't find the right uh, thing I was looking for in one area to go on the coffee table that kind of matches the beach theme in our living room. And I'm here to represent my graduates today. Can I get a witness? Right? Uh, I've seen this group wear more Hawaiian shirts in my student ministry than all student ministry combines. But I'm here to represent you all and, uh, and just want to showcase. So I wasn't just showing off. It was to show some love to you all. But, I, but I, that does feel good. I might wear them more often, I'll just tell you. It's hot. It's, it's, they're comfortable. I, I, I was looking for an anchor, a certain kind of anchor for the table. I got the picture I wanted of some beach houses over the microwave but I was looking for a little bit bigger anchor. The one I picked up was ideal if it was bigger. And listen to me. If you're not anchored to Jesus Christ and his word, you will drift. It's a fact. I'm already thinking of who all might be drifting already in our church. Two and a half months have gone by since we've last met. And although online preaching is fine, not meeting in person has some negativity. Let's just be real about it. And there's going to be some people who are going to think that from now on, even when things are even cleaner and better, that their opportunity to meet in person doesn't need to be met because this fulfills it online. 
I assure you, and anyone listening, that is not biblical. Meeting in person is very important to the body of Christ when things are back to normal. Are you with me? All I'm saying is this. Some people will start to drift. And this will be an opportunity by the enemy to cause them to just go about their merry way. That concerns me, church. It concerns me for these graduates. I don't worry over you. I pray over you. But here's what I pray about, that you will always anchor yourself to Jesus Christ and his work. If you do that, you will not drift away from the Lord Jesus Christ. It will not be like student ministry days where we had the hub. It may not be where you had special events of somersault and other things that we do. But let me tell you, there's more things that God will add to replace that in a healthy way with community. But stay anchored to Jesus. Like if today is my last message, that's what I'm saying. If I was to draw it right after this last message and I go home to be with the Lord, I'm telling you, anchor it to Jesus. I beg you. Because you will go the distance. We won't find you just out in another world, another part of the world, not anchored to anything. And we go, what happened to them? Where are they at? Are they any church anywhere? No, unfortunately, the enemy duped them. We don't want that for you. We've never wanted it for you. We've never wanted it for anybody part of the church as a whole. We want you to go the distance. To do that means you have to anchor yourself. That is a scary verse, lest we drift away. And so if you say, well, how do we protect? What's the remedy from drifting? Listening. Obeying. That's the remedy from drifting. It's really not hard. Listening. Obeying, trusting, practicing faith in the Lord, persevering even in pandemics. It easily happens. One doesn't have to do anything to drift. You know what you have to do to drift? Nothing. Nothing. You ever been on a float in the lake? All of a sudden... You're just kind of laying back, taking it easy. Before you know it, you look up and you go, my goodness, look how far away from the shore I have gotten. You didn't do anything to do it on purpose, but you wasn't intentional about keeping yourself in in an exact area, a location. So by doing nothing often results in drifting. How many times do we hear of another story of someone who has come out and that realized Not only have they drifted, they have drifted so far off, here's what they'll say, I no longer believe in God. It just happened again this week. A notarized singer by the name of John Steingard from Hawk Nelson, a contemporary Christian group, who I didn't listen to early in life because they was just flat out non-Christian. They said Christian, but I know better by the lyrics. And so I, I, I just say, well, I, I'm not, I don't want somebody who's a pretender. Well, then there was, some, there was some change in their lyrics. But this person just came out recently with a nine-page Instagram post and says, I no longer believe in God. I, I, I sympathize with this man because there's a lot of things he has gone through and a lot of things he was taught by some people that was not biblical. And it's hurt him, a 36-year-old man, who supposedly sings Christian music. But here's what he said, and I quote, The process of getting to that sentence has been several years in the making. It didn't happen overnight or all of a sudden. Did you hear that? It's a drift. It was slow. It wasn't a sudden departure. He continues to say, and this is where I question The authenticity of what he said he had. Once I found I didn't believe the Bible was the perfect word of God. It didn't take long to realize that I was no longer sure he was there at all. He said he and his wife, sadly it grieves me, didn't enjoy going to church. Didn't enjoy reading the Bible. I'm quoting him. Didn't enjoy praying, didn't enjoy worship, 
And it all felt like just an obligation. That saddens me. Uh, that what it says is, never do I believe biblically did that man have an actual encounter with Jesus Christ. Because I'm going to here tell you, this 12-year-old boy at 3213 Comanche Street who did not grow up in a home with Jesus, never heard, never saw, or read a Bible until I was 12 years old, and Jesus Christ, through His power and His Holy Spirit preaching God's Word, opened up my eyes to the good news of Jesus Christ. And with all the lostness surrounding me in a sea of lostness, Jesus Christ touched this Son, this one whom He loved. He initiated that love. I didn't love Him first, as Pastor Aaron said. He loved me first. And when He touched me, He radically changed my life. It was not just a whim. It was, not, it was convenient. It was not because my mom and daddy went to church. Jesus Christ touched me and has forever changed my life. It's not an obligation to serve him. It is not a payroll check I work for. It is for the glory of Jesus Christ and the furtherance of his name. I'm here to tell you the enemy has deceived so many people and they started drifting and thought they was anchored to something that was not the, not the anchor of all anchors. And when you get a hold of Jesus, you won't have to guess if he's real. You won't have to say, is he, is he there? You'll know that he's there. You'll know that he's real. You'll know it. There will be no second guessing. And I know there's questions. You don't have to worry about your doubts. God can handle your doubts. You don't have to worry that, is it okay to question God? You can handle, God can handle your questions. But listen to me, when you say, I'm seeking, but I've sought no more, i found my answers, and I'm turning to the self-help books of the world, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Now, I feel for this man, I'm going to pray for this man and his family, that God would save his soul. Look in verse 2, B. Verse 2 says, for since the, the message, the writer said, it's for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. This is an interesting... This describes the Mosaic law which was received, obviously God to, to Moses, but it tells us at the direction of angels. You say, where is that at? Acts 7.53, Galatians 3.19 talks about... We don't know exactly, but the idea is that the law was delivered in some way to Moses by the hand of angels. They've always been messengers. They don't preach the message. They just deliver the message. You can look up those verses. In fact, Acts 7.53, when Stephen was preaching to the stiff-necked Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders, he tells them, hey, hey, listen to me. You, uh, you, you persecuted the righteous one. You received the law from angels, but you did not keep it. Galatians 3.19 tells us it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. So it tells us in verse 2, the angels that, that, that provided this message, it was reliable. It was steadfast. And because of this message, it, it, it showed us what we are, sinners, and it shows us how we can walk with the Lord. And praise God He didn't leave us abandoned. Because of our sinful state. He didn't leave us on our own. He came to us. You're talking about uh, Pastor Aaron saying earlier this morning, he ran after Jacob. He's still running after us. I like, I like the words reliable. Look in verse 2. He says it's reliable. God's word is reliable, students. Let me tell you something. Please don't get away from this book. I, I beg you in Jesus' name. From Genesis to Revelation, read it, study it, live it, apply it. Don't get too wise for yourselves to think that you don't still don't need this book that you was brought up for it, coming through a wanna. If you memorize it in wanna, why can't we memorize it as adults? It's still the book. It's still in here that the gospel still loves you, and it's still a book for you to apply in all situations of your life. Don't shuck it. God's word demands that we take it serious. Verse three says it's an interesting verse. A question: How? Shall we escape, circle, if we neglect salvation? That is, we must take the word which came by angels seriously, but we also must take more seriously the word that came by the Son of God. 
his preaching. That is, he's proven to be greater than the angels. He's regarded greater. This word neglect uh, is also used in Matthew 22, verse 5, of the disregard, the invitation that was sent out to the people for the wedding feast for his son. The people paid no attention. They made light of it. They were given opportunity, but they ignored it. They disregarded it. That's what the word neglect is. You said, I received it. You professed it, but you neglect living it out. There's danger, yes, this is no-brainer, in rejecting salvation. We would all agree with that. You don't, you don't receive Jesus Christ, you reject the gospel. The Bible says there's consequences, eternal consequences, separated from the Lord. But there is grave danger in neglecting salvation. That was written to those who neglected abiding walk with Jesus. John chapter 15, it's mentioned 10 or 11 times about the word abide, abide in Christ. Trump's translations say remain. It means to set up permanent residence. You was not just to walk with Jesus while you was in children's ministry, student ministry, or in college ministry. It was to be a permanent residence with J-E-S-U-S on your address. You can't move away from it. That would be neglecting. Notice the word, so great a salvation. He says, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? That is, if we do not consider something great, we leave it to convenience. Hello? And rather than to commitment. So if you don't think it's great, guess what? You won't read the Bible as much, and you won't tend church, you won't gather with other believers. Great. I'm telling you, it's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Ever. Salvation came into my soul. It changed me. It changed my eternity, but it changed my immediate life. The phrase, so great a salvation, or such a great salvation, is a striking reminder of John 3, 16, when God said, God so loved. He didn't say he loved. He so loved. It emphasizes, it puts the major emphasis on, It's an unfathomable depth of love. And so it tells us salvation is not just salvation. It's it's an unfathomable depth of rescuing us. Our Christ is a great Savior. Why? Because He paid a great cost. And He delivered us from a great penalty. One commentary says, A reason many neglect their salvation is because they never see it as salvation. They see it merely as receiving something, not being rescued from something. I got rescued. I was in a free fall toward hell. That's how I see the Bible. Free fall toward hell, but didn't know it. And Jesus Christ came through a life vest to me, through his son and what he did on the cross, and rescued me. He didn't just give me something. He saved me from perishing. That's biblical. When you see it as like that, you're always thankful for the one who saved you. You can't help but constantly com- commit a thankful heart that he saved you because you knew where you was going. Verse 3, 4, and B says this. It was declared at first by the Lord. And it was attested to us by those who heard. So this writer tells us, hey, we heard the gospel. The Lord preached it. Then it was a preach to others. And then they preached it to us. We passed it down to those who had heard it before. It was also observed or confirmed, look in verse 4, that God bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles. So it tells us God didn't leave himself without evidence. There's historical evidence about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You should read and believe the book just like it is. But listen to me, there's historical evidence about, about Jesus' resurrection, about the church. But I didn't need to go to Israel to believe the book. I believed the book before I went to Israel. I believed the book more so than ever in light of visiting Israel because of the historical evidence there. But I'm telling you, I didn't need to see Israel to know that Jesus is alive. I believe it by faith. I believe it by faith. The Spirit brought these gifts according to His will. That is, miracles can't be worked up to prove people uh, brought about by human effort or motion. 
Signs and wonders and miracles, this verse says, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit affirms God's word. It's hard to say which is worse, the denial of miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit or the counterfeit of them. They're out there. Let me give you an example of drifting. This is a serious text. Peter comes to my mind as one example who I knew loved the Lord, but he got caught up in the flesh. There's, there's a text I've traced with the students, and surely you've heard it once or several times since you've been in my student ministry, that Peter was a person who walked so closely to Jesus, was a bold leader. I'm talking about out front, a guy that had, was an all-in kind of spirit guy, found himself in a state of drift. Check it out. Just listen to the text. In Luke 5, 1 through 11, we see Peter and the apostles have a call of God on the ministry in their lives. They forsake all and they follow Jesus. They drop their fishing nets to follow Jesus. It's an awesome picture. Drop it and to follow Jesus. We move through the scriptures and we're getting closer to the eve of when Jesus is actually going to uh, be betrayed. And uh, as it's ramping up, there's times when Peter has a few moments that just seems to lapse him because he, he drifted for a moment. He didn't anchor himself to God in his exact word. He kind of wanted to lead out and think that he had the better plans than Jesus did. In Matthew 26, 31 through 35, it says that they all said, I will not deny you even if we have to die. Peter was one saying that, so did all the disciples. They all said, P P John said, uh, Jesus said, hey, this night you will betray me. And they said, no, 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 if we all have to die, we're going with you. Note that. We move through that evening, Mark chapter 14, 43 through 50. The soldiers show up, and a ruckus breaks out, and Peter takes a sword and cuts off the ear of, do you know the name? Malchus. Who, who knew the name? Thank you, Daniel. Ask me, I'll see that hand. I've asked that question at least 500 times in student ministry. Mm. I might have an extra cheesecake card for you in the back, by the way. That's what we gave you, by the way. I started about giving you a gift card to Bob Evans' restaurant, but I don't think we can find that anywhere in Greenville. <laughs> I didn't think y'all want to go to Bob Evans. I got good food, though, but cheesecake, I'm sure, is your delight. Check this out. Soldiers show up, cut. Peter comes out of his sword, cuts off Malchus's ear, and they all forsake him. How is it just a few hours earlier they say, we'll die with you, and all of a sudden they're running. They're in a drift. Then a scary verse comes into play. Matthew 26, verse 58, and Mark 15, verse 54. It's a scary verse. It says, as Jesus is being captured, they've already beaten him somewhat, punched him, pulled his beard. He's near Caiaphas' house. In fact, the mob has already been organized, and they're going to ramrod this so-called, uh, this case, push it through. And uh, there's a charcoal fire out in the courtyard. We've been there. And Peter is warming his hands around the charcoal fire with some of the other people. But the Bible says this. This is scary. Peter follows Jesus at a distance. This is the leader of the church. One of the strongest leaders of the church. Who was right there with Jesus when Jesus called him. Who's been saying all along, I'm going to die with you. I'm going to go the distance with you. How is it then when, when trouble breaks out, Peter can't be nowhere found close to Jesus other than at a distance. How can a man who loved Jesus so find himself at a distance now? See, we all can say we love Jesus now, even the strongest of us. But if we're not careful, we could start drifting and find ourselves at a distance before you even realize it. That's why you have to guard. The remedy is to listen. The remedy is to apply God's word and continue to apply it all the days of your life. It's such a, um, it's such a situation that he didn't want to join himself because he didn't want to... I'd be identified as a follower because they might beat him up or brutally hurt him as they're hurting Jesus. And to Luke chapter 22, verses 54 through 62, we find the horrific. Peter denies him three times. 
the flesh gets the best of him. In fact, the third time he even uses a cuss word. And Jesus, in all of his sovereignty, knows this. You're talking about still loving us in spite of where we're at? I don't know how or where in proximity of the courtyard, but it was evidently close enough that Jesus could make eye contact with Peter. And the Bible says he looks to him. And they make eye contact. And it was almost the same. Oh, Peter, I told you. And it must have broke Peter's heart so much that the Bible says he goes out and he weeps because he had failed the Lord. We're all going to fail the Lord. I have too many to count. But you got to get back up and keep following. You repent and you keep following. You repent and you keep following. And you're not working to earn his love. You're working to show him that you care about him. You love him. And, and he works with us even in our failures. That's grace. That's forgiveness. You're going to need a lot of it as you go forward. And Peter, by God's grace, he restores him before he finishes and goes to heaven. How did a man get this way? It's by drifting. It's a slow fade. One step in the wrong direction can be grave to your life. You know how one step in the wrong direction starts with? Just a small compromise. Just a little here, a little there, a little more here, a little more there. And before you know it, you want to know how in the world did you get that far away from Jesus? Just one compromise. One little compromise. It happens every time. I just want to show you the example the example that we should follow, look in verses 9 and 10 as we wrap up. Hebrews 2, 9 and 10. Notice when I, I emphasize this for us as the writer says that Jesus is the crown, has been crowned with glory and honor. That he came to, to suffer for us, to taste death for us that is in our place. He was the atonement for our sins. But look in verse 10, highlight verse 10, put a bracket around it. It says, for it was fitting that he, Jesus, for whom, by for whom, and by whom all things exist. So it tells us how the world came to be. It's through Jesus, the Son. And it says, in bringing many sons to glory, many daughters, many people to Christ. Notice this phrase, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. The founder could mean pioneer or author. You know, Jesus was not just a starter, he was a finisher. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was battling the flesh, and the flesh was saying no, and the Spirit was saying yes, and the flesh was saying no, and the Spirit was saying yes, he crucified the flesh, and he said, I am going to do the will of the Father. And he did. If he had stopped short in the Garden of Gethsemane, none of us would need to meet today. There'll be no reason to meet, because there'll be no reason to have any hope. There'll be no hope because of the no cross. But because Jesus went the distance, we have hope. We have reason to meet and a reason to celebrate. Our pioneer, our author, our founder finished it. And he expects all those who follow him to do the same. Do you know why? He's already at the finish line. He's beckoning us. Come on. He knows the struggles. You say, how do you know? Because the Bible says... Hebrews 12, 3, consider him who endured such sinners, from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. So students, I know you already work in many of you. Many of you are about to enter college. There's going to be many things in store for you. Some are already advanced degrees and about to do even more. Some... So there are going to be some trials that's pretty hard. Some of you are going to go through some stuff, and it's going to be pretty hard. Jesus has already been there. You're talking about encouragement. He's the one to give you that hope, to go the distance. We, as Christians, need to have some guts about our faith. We just got to go the distance, even when it's hard. Don't drift, church. The remedy is pay attention. Stay in the Word. Keep your eyes on Jesus. 
Jesus and the Word go hand in hand. You can't separate the two. Decide today and tomorrow and every day to keep on following Jesus. I can't get away from, from some songs lately. Been reading a lot of lyrics just from different hymns and songs of today. And uh, it still applies to our life. And I start reading the lyrics of this song that I have decided to follow Jesus. There's no turning back. There's no turning back. Verse 2 says, though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Verse 3 says, my cross I'll carry. It's not going to be easy. That's why he emphasizes the cross. Take up your cross and follow him daily. Luke 9, 23. He says, no turning back, no turning back. He says, the world behind me and the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. If you have not experienced in this room or online the joy of Jesus Christ, the freedom in Christ, the salvation in Christ, the hope in Christ, the joy in Christ. The Bible says it's yours for the taking. He loves you. He cares about you. And a relationship, to start a relationship with Jesus Christ is the most crucial thing you can add to your life. It's a necessity. And life will never feel at peace. This man, this singer will never be at peace. I already saw online where many people said, have you read so-and-so? And the list is this long of people who don't know Jesus. He says, yes, I've already started inquiring. I don't need to read any further. This is it. Your answers is in here. Graduates, please. We call you a few weeks from now few years from now, 10 years from now, I hope and pray I'll say, hey, tell me about it. What's been going on in your life with you and God? What you been reading lately? What you been studying? Tell me something. I pray we have a discussion about the Lord then. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you for this day. I thank you for Jesus. I'm just one dying man speaking to another dying man about Jesus. Lord, we have hope in you, Lord. If we draw our last breath today, we'll be with you. That's confidence in you. That's confidence in the cross and what the cross did for us. Thank you, Lord, for the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, right now I pray for our graduates that they will continue to follow Jesus and not just a little. I'm talking about all in. And I pray this church, Edward Joe Baptist Church, will be a church that follows Jesus all its days of existence until you call us home. But it will be a church that glorifies you. It will be a church that lives by your word, obeys your word. Help us not be a church that drifts. Help us not to neglect our salvation. Lord, help us to listen. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, for coming to us, and thank you, Lord, for caring for us. Lord, the church hasn't heard today that Jesus loves them. I pray they'll be reminded of that one more time. Lord, thank you for this day. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.